Hello, all, and welcome to this very important talk. I am Professor Jody Russell Manning, and I am the program director for the Rowan Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights. Although my graduate students are required to read the seminal work Bloodlands, Europe Between hey, Vicky. and Stalin, um, written by our guests, of course, you, we are here do today you recognize to recognize this guy here. Another one of. No. He once gave us a tour of Auschwitz. Sorry, I just want to remind everybody to please uh, mute um, your microphones. Thank you as you join. Um, I just was saying that although my graduate students, of course, are required to read um, Professor Snyder's seminal work, Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin, we are here today to discuss another one of his numerous award-winning books. Exploring the theme of authoritarianism, um, the Center's book club has spent this semester reading the graphic edition of On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century by our guest, and it's illustrated by Nora Krug. Um, Timothy Snyder's New York Times bestseller on tyranny uses the darkest moments in the 20th century history, from Nazism to communism, to teach 20 lessons on resisting modern day tyranny. In this graphic edition, Nora Krug draws from her highly in inventive art style to breathe new life, color, and power into Snyder's riveting historical references. In a time of great uncertainty, and instability, this edition of On Tyranny emphasizes the importance of being active, conscious, and deliberate participants in resistance. The Center's book club was designed to exchange ideas, share opinions, and explore a main theme that makes connections and opens up bigger questions. We are very happy to have you as our guest, Professor Snyder, and thank you, thank you to our book club co-sponsors, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, the Office of Social Justice, Inclusion and Conflict Resolution, and the Holly Bush Institute for Global Peace and Security. So with that, I will turn it over to our, the director of the Holly Bush Institute, Jim Heinzen. Hi, thank you, Jody. Uh, I'm Jim Heinzen. I'm a professor of history at Rowan and the director of the Holly Bush Institute for Global Peace and Security. The Hollybush Institute is a center here at Rowan focused on global affairs and the rule of law. Today, we have the extraordinary opportunity to talk with Dr. Timothy Snyder. There are really few scholars in the world who are in a better position to help us contextualize historically the Russian war against Ukraine in the past two weeks than Dr. Snyder. And I have it on good authority that most days there are camera crews near Dr. Snyder's office at Yale because he's such a sought after commentator on this tragic situation. So we're extremely fortunate that Dr. Snyder can join us today. Timothy Snyder is the Richard C. Levin Professor of History at Yale University and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He's the author of eight books, including six that examine the history of Ukraine, including, as Jody said earlier, Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin, The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America, and On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, the book that we've invited him to talk to us about today. Dr. Snyder's achievements are really uh, way too many to, to list, but I'll just mention a couple of them. He has received the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Carnegie Fellowship, and many others, as well as multiple awards and prizes for his books. One piece of evidence about the influence of his scholarship is the fact that his books have been translated into 40 languages. That's four zero. When we invited Dr. Schneider to join us at Rowan, he asked us to help him in his effort to support independent bookstores. And so we're placing links in the chat that will let you purchase On Tyranny or any of Dr. Schneider's other books through the Words Matter bookstore located in Pittman. You can order those books online or just drop by the store. Uh, the name of the bookstore, Words Matter, is actually an important idea in Dr. Snyder's book on tyranny. Um, a quick mention of one of the co-sponsors of the event. This event is made possible by a UISFL grant from the US Department of Education. So as far as the questions and answers go and the format of this um, talk, we are going to um, ask, Jody and I are gonna ask Dr. Snyder a few questions uh, to get things rolling. And then after about 30 minutes or so, we'll open the floor up to questions from the audience. There's two ways that you can ask a question. One is to raise your hand with the Zoom raise hand function, and we'll call on you and ask you to unmute yourself 
and turn your video on, and then you can pose your question directly to Dr. Snyder. Another way is to type your question in the question and answer, and we will um, we'll monitor the Q&A and, and uh, Dr. Sharnak will transmit those questions to us. So I'll just turn things over to Jody for the first question. Thank you, Jim. So I know that the Russian-Ukraine war is on a lot of people's minds, and we will ask you about that soon. But first, could you tell us what were the origins of writing on tyranny and its importance for you? And could you discuss its subsequent journey to a graphic novel? Oh, you are muted, unfortunately, sorry. Yeah, there, no, no. Thanks. So I was I was following instructions and I had myself muted like a you know like like a like a good obedient person, um, but this is a book about how you're not supposed to always be obedient. On on tyranny, as some of you will know, um, I, I'm I'm flattered that some of you have read it. Is a political pamphlet. It's not an academic book. It's a very it's a very short book, and rather than describing the world, it, its point is to to change it by recognizing the way that the world is and by the way we tend to behave in the world. So, it, it arose in 2016 when um, a number of things were happening. Um, the, the the United Kingdom was moving away from 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 the European Union. Um, the, uh, the Russia had completed an aggressive war in Ukraine, which was um, which was successful largely thanks to digital propaganda, which fooled a lot of people. And a surprising American presidential campaign had had succeeded, um, bringing a hitherto uh, largely unknown politician the Republican nomination, and and then the president's presidency itself. So I wrote the book in a few days in late 2016 to try to give people pause. Um, to try to give people a chance to establish what they actually thought was normal in the world. The very first lesson in the book is called Don't Obey in Advance. And Don't Obey in Advance means checking what's going on around you against what you yourself think is valuable. Because if you don't check, if you just normalize what happens from moment to moment, then you become part of the problem. And once you become part of the problem, you, you start making excuses for yourself and then you can never change. But the book arose in a deeper sense from the things that Jim was kind enough to mention. I, I could write this book with references to smarter people than us who survived you know, Nazi Germany or survived Stalin Soviet Union because I'd spent the previous 25 years as a historian of, of Eastern and Central Europe. So I was drawing from all of that and I was drawing from things that I understood in Eastern Europe when I, I wrote this little book about proposing to Americans what I thought we ought to be able to do. The graphic part, I mean, it's more you know, inspiration and serendipity. You know, I'm a big believer in just going to library shelves and looking for books. And in the case of Nora Krug, her book came across my desk. Nora Krug, who is, you know, she's brilliant. She's fantastic. Um, her book, Homeland or um, Heimat, came across my desk. And I picked it up and I thought, aha, this is the person who should illustrate on tyranny. This is a sensibility which is deep and, and, and fascinating and very different from my own. And so I allowed, you know, what happened was that I, I cold called her basically. I had lunch with her and I just dropped the idea on her and happily she went along with it. We didn't know each other before that. And then she redid the book. You know, it's not that she and I talked about every panel, on the contrary. I mean, she imposed her sensibility on the book, making it a deeper and, and, uh, and more profound um, work of art. I mean, making a different kind of book than it was before. So I'm, I'm very happy that, you know, I'm very happy that Nora brought her talent to this book because she's made it something, something different and something, you know, something different than I could have imagined. Sorry. Um, I'd just like to ask you uh, a, a very large question, a, a little bit unfair, just to, for our audience that have many of whom are new to, to knowing much, if anything, about Ukraine. Um, as a scholar of Ukraine, who's done tremendous work over several decades, in fact, um, can you talk about what it's like to be a historian in the midst of, you know, in a way, it's, it's probably one of your worst nightmares, a, a Russian invasion of Ukraine fairly unexpected in some ways, at least it took a lot of people by surprise, but what do you bring to bear as a historian on this, on this situation? Yeah, Jim, I appreciate you, the way you've set up the question because 
on the one hand, in, in human terms, this is this is a terrible time. Um, I mean, for the for the for the for the Ukrainians, for the citizens of Ukraine who are subject to this terrible, you know, and completely unjustifiable, senseless invasion. I mean, in a way, I think calling it senseless doesn't even do doesn't even do it justice. It's like a kind of nonsense creating war. It's not only senseless; it's also covered in this propaganda, which is meant to confuse and perverse per pervert everything. But um, it's a terrible it's a terrible time for me, you know, derivatively, secondarily, because I, I know these places. I mean, you know, Kharkiv, which is being destroyed, is a place that I that I care about, you know, and in Kiev, which is being slowly encircled is one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. I mean, in other circumstances, it's a place where I want our students to go um, because it's so interesting because the art scene, the music scene, or, or the food scene are so, fan so fantastic. Dnipro, which is, you know, being encircled, another fantastic city, you know, these are just, these are places that I know, you know, I'm watching, I've seen buildings where I've been in or stood in front of, you know, now be, now be destroyed. And I, I spend my time, you know, trying to keep track of people and trying to think of how I can help people. And so, you know, that's all terrible. But I'm glad to be a historian because as a historian, you know, I, I, I have reference points for all of this. You know, I have, there are things that I have at my fingertips that are the background, you know, not necessarily the explanation, but at least the background for what's happening. It's things might be surprising, but nothing is entirely new. And then also as a historian, you have this, uh, you have a, the capacity to judge other people's propaganda. You know, I mean, there was a, there was a, there was a 18th, there was a historian called Louis Namier who, um, who said, being a historian doesn't necessarily allow you to know what's true, but it does allow you to know what's not true. And that's a skill which comes in very handy during a propaganda war, during an information war. It means that you may, might see through things more quickly than other people or have a sure, be sure about yourself when you're, when you're decoding ideology and trying to explain it. So I'm really glad that, I mean, it's, I'm really glad that I'm a historian because I think being a historian gives me gives me something to say. It gives me a language which I can use. I mean, I'm teaching about Ukraine. It's, it's strange because I'm teaching 20th century Eastern Europe right now. I mean, we just had a lecture about the you know insurgency and counterinsurgency in Ukraine during the Second World War, you know, which is just all too relevant. Um, so but it also gives me a language that I can use with anyone. You know, which I can use with reporters, which I can use on, on on television. It allows me to bring things together in a way which you know helps people to understand. So I'm glad I'm glad I'm a historian at this time. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you see the current situation in Europe playing out? And I I know that's a very tough question, um, and um, yes, as, as an expert in, in, I think your insight will be very valuable here. So can you tell me, can you tell me, Jody, what you mean by the current situation? So, so the situation, of course, in Ukraine and, and how, how you see this, this playing out as we go along, um, mm -hmm. as it's continually shifting and changing and, and your mm -hmm. thoughts on, on where this will go. Yeah. So I guess we should probably say a word about what 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 is before we talk about what's going to be. Um, 12, 12 days ago, um, 13 days ago, Russia attacked Ukraine. Russia invaded Ukraine um, entirely without provocation. Um, various propaganda reasons have been given having to do with, you know, um, the three ends, nukes, Nazis, and NATO, uh, which they talk about to various degrees to various people, but none of which seem to have um, any basis in reality. Um, the, 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 sh the shocking thing about this war, there are two shocking things. The first is that it's happening at all, that a big country would invade a small country for no reason. This doesn't happen so often um, uh, with the full, you know, basically with the full force of its military power. This doesn't happen very often, but the, the second shocking thing about it is the language that's used around it. So 
what Putin, the leader of Russia, what he actually says is that Ukraine is not really a state and Ukrainians are not really a nation. And this is, this is shocking language because it recalls the 20th century. Um, I mean, just to give a specific example, it recalls 1938 and 1939 and the way that um, Hitler talked about Austria, Czechoslovakia and Poland in the run up to and then in the beginning of the Second World War. It also incidentally recalls the way that Stalin talked about Poland in 1939 before the Soviet Union invaded Poland. And by no coincidence, um, Russian memory law right before this war began was tightened. There's a Russian memory law which makes it a crime to talk about how the Soviet Union was an ally of Nazi Germany in 1939, which of course it was, and we should be happy that we, should, we can say awkward things because history is all about awkward things. It's all about things people don't want to hear, but which happen to be true. And that's and that's the case whether you're in America or Russia or anywhere else, right? But um, right before this war began, they tightened their the, the criminal penalties for talking about that period in history. And I think that's no coincidence because what, what Putin is doing is so similar. His speeches are practically plagiarized from 1938 and 1939. Um, but the implication when you say another nation is not real or another state is not real is that you have the right to destroy that state and that nation. Um, I'm using the examples of 1938 and 1939, but that is also something we know from the entire history of, of colonialism in general. This is the language that Europeans founding settler empires also used when they encountered peoples in the Americas or in Asia or in Africa. When you encounter something that looks like a state, you say it's not really a state. You encounter a people and you say you're not really a nation, right? That is, the, that is a 500 year habit of world history, which we're now seeing repeated in the 21st century in the way Putin talks about Ukraine. And so it has this destructive, or as we would now say, genocidal implication that the people and the state have to be destroyed. And one of the reasons that the Ukrainians are fighting so hard is that they understand what I just said. They don't need as many words as I just used to explain it, but they understand, you know, whatever we might think, they understand that the object of this war is, is to wipe them out as a people. And you know, one of the reasons that we know this, by the way, Jody, is that the 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 Russians accidentally published their victory declaration um, the day after the war. They were expecting this war to last one day, and there was a kind of official victory declaration which was supposed to be published on day two, but of course was pulled because they hadn't won from most of the media. But they didn't pull it from all of the media, and it says basically what I'm saying now: We have destroyed the Ukrainian state. We have destroyed the Ukrainian elite. Everyone else is going over to our side. It's over. We're going to join Ukraine and Russia forever. Hallelujah. It's a, it's a, it's a shocking and a frightening document. So I say all that just to kind of describe where we are. I think where it's going um, is very hard to say. I mean, I'll say two very general things. Number one, this is not really a war that anybody can win. Um, I mean, that's that's been kind of the wisdom from the beginning. And even Russian experts who, by the way, I think generally sincerely did not believe that this war was coming. I think the, one of the reasons why they didn't think it was coming was because it's so stupid from a Russian point of view to try to invade a country of 40 million people, um, which, you know, which, which really is a state and really is a nation. Um, and then the second thing I'm gonna say is that, and I, I'm sorry if this sounds like a dodge, it, the reason why this is hard to predict is that so much depends on one person. So we, we are now, you know, in, in political science and in other social sciences, we assume that people are more or less rational. And then we assume that there are institutions that kind of control or check human behavior. But in Russia today, it's more like we're in Shakespeare territory, you know, or we're in Plato book eight, book nine of the Republic territory. We're talking about a tyrant, like in the classical sense, not constrained by anybody, not constrained by institutions, getting older, more fascinated with his own ideas every day and, and less in touch with the world. Add to that two years of COVID isolation, right, which is not good for, for anybody in any circumstances. Um, and then and, and in a situation where nobody is telling him the truth. You know, I just can't imagine that anyone is telling Putin the truth right now. So the reason why it's hard to predict is that we're, it's kind of, kind of depends on one person. I guess what I would say is that 
I think the moment when Putin realizes that his own rule might be threatened by this is the moment when Russia might start to make some kind of move towards a ceasefire. Um, I just would say, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Snyder one more question and then we're gonna turn things over to the audience. So if you have questions and would like to be recognized, this is a good time to uh, raise your, your virtual hand. Um, uh, I have a lot of, I'm teaching two classes on Russian history this semester and we spend a lot of time talking about Ukraine. A lot of people are, would like to help. A lot of people feel helpless. And you know this is this is something that is um, that I think tyrants want people to feel helpless, yeah. and and they're very good at doing that. They they manipulate language, they manipulate emotion, um, and um, you know your book is also is about is about to a large degree as you as you explained at the beginning, it's about a, a kind of a handbook for ordinary people to to fight tyranny. Um, do you have specific uh, recommendations or do you have thoughts about, about we as Americans or young people, let's say, not, not only young people who are feeling helpless can do um, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, to fight this? Yeah, I, 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 I do. I mean, um, some of them are, you know, so the thing about on tyranny is that it's not, it, it, it was written from a particular moment, going back to Jody's first question, but it's not written for a particular moment. The things that are on tyranny are, gen, are, are things that are generally a good idea to do for, for civic engagement. And um, a, couple of, a couple of lessons in there are, are, are very relevant to today. One of them is um, corporeal politics which I think is lesson 13. I don't always remember the numbers because I, I switched them around at the beginning myself. But, right um, but, uh, it's, but corporeal politics is the idea that you can you show you care about something by putting your body somewhere. And of course there are dramatic examples of this, like people protesting in, in, in authoritarian regimes, like for example, the courageous Russians who are now protesting for peace. Um, you know, thousands and thousands of whom are now arrested. But it's all, even if you're not facing any kind of a risk, um, putting just, just taking the trouble to put your body somewhere is a sign of commitment, which is visible to others. And it also helps you to remember that you cared, right? So like protests and marches that you go on are things that you remember later on. They help you to remember that you have a stake in things. So one thing you can do is you can look around, you can check um, the, the website of Razom, for example, R-A-Z-O-M, for protests and rallies that are in your area and, and, and go to them. Another thing which is on tyranny, um, a lesson on, in on tyranny, which is relevant is be kind to the language. And, and here it's important um, to speak clearly and to use subjects and objects. So I'll just give you an example. You know, when I have I have friends and colleagues who are you know talking to Russians about the war, and there are all kinds of ways that you can use the language, um, any language, to blur agency, to blur responsibility. So people will say, "Well, before all this started," and what they mean is before Russia invaded Ukraine, right, or before our troops crossed the Ukrainian border. And so we, those of us who have freedom of speech and, and, and should practice speaking directly, I mean, this applies to our politics too, but we should practice speaking directly. We should use subjects and objects, nouns and verbs, and, say, and, and, and just remember to say war and not conflict. Um, and to talk about an invasion, you know, rather than, you know, rather than the situation, because if we don't do that, then, then if we lose track in our words of what's happening, then we can't think. And if we can't think, then we, then we can't do. Um, and then one, you know, one, one more thing, which is pretty easy, is, is money. I mean, I, I know a lot of folks who are listening to this aren't rolling in it, but remember that the average Ukrainian family, live, the average Ukrainian family lives on something like $400 a month, okay? And that was before the war. That was before the war. The, 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 the GDP per capita in Ukraine is about five, six thousand dollars. So whereas like for comparison in the US, it's about seventy thousand um, dollars. 
Uh, so, you know, the average the average Ukrainian is is getting by on much less than even the average student in the United States, right? And so, and and that was before the war started. I'm not citing war statistics. I'm just citing that the way that life was like before the schools and the hospitals and the houses were bombed. Which means that you know, if you can find a charity and just give you give somebody five dollars a week, you know, like if you just set your credit card to give one charity five dollars a week, right? The price of a latte, just like five dollars a week, you're doing something, you know. And uh, and I'm, I'm sure some people on this call can afford to do more than that. And so again, Razom, um, R A Z O M, they have the Razom Emergency Fund uh, is a good place to to, to do this, um, but. For details, I would just, I don't, I'm sorry to self promote, but I have a Substack, um, which you don't have to join. It's free, blah, blah, blah. But on my Substack, I have a list of charities, and a lot of them just have credit cards and they make it really easy to do things like this. And, it's, and that's a little bit like corporeal politics. Like if you put a little tiny bit of money into something now, at the beginning, then you'll remember that you were involved. Like, and then you have a little bit of a stake in it. And, and trust me, like it does, like there's some really wonderful organizations who are doing some really important things. And it feels good to think, okay, I actually helped them do something. And with like $5 or $10 or $20, you can actually, you can actually do that. That's great. Uh, Debbie Sharnak has placed uh, the, a link to Razom and to your Substack in the chat. So people now can access that easily. Um, I'm going to call on Sean French, who has his hand raised. If you would just um, un unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm not going to ask for a prediction on what will happen in terms of regime regime change or that being forced upon people or what sanctions may do. My question is more about how institutionalized the state security apparatus is in Russia. I don't have very much knowledge on it, but my understanding is that during the transition in the 90s from the Soviet Union to uh, the Russian Federation, that was one of the things that carried over and is still present today in the regime. Mm -hmm. Is it really, because often when we hear, learn about it or hear about it, it's very Putin-centric or just a small collection of people. How institutionalized is that? Is it as simple as saying in 10 years, Russia will be very different from what it is today if Putin is no longer the leader. Okay. Yeah. Um, great, great question. And before I answer it, I just want to point out that there are a lot of there are a lot of really qualified um, Putin watchers and Putin scholars in the world. Some of them might be on this call even. But you know, there's there's a book by um, uh, there's a there's a book by um, Fiona Hill, recent book which is very good. There's a book from a few years ago by by Masha Gessen. Um, that, that, that people with real understanding of the Russian state. Let me just say three basic things, Sean, which get close to answering your question. N number one, you're right about institutional continuity. Um, the, the KGB, um, the, the KGB of the Soviet Union becomes the FSB, the FSB of, of Russia. And it is not irrelevant that the current president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, was a KGB officer in East Germany in the 1980s. And rather than experiencing the Gorbachev period and Glasnost and Perestroika, he experienced those years, the late 1980s, as, as years of great insecurity and, un, and uncertainty. Uh, and then number two, the FSB is certainly very important in Russia today. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the one of the forms of tension in the Russian state, which clearly is visible, is the tension between the FSB and um, an alternative security organization called the Roskvardia, um, which is which is created among other things from from Chechens who went over to the Russian side after Russia finally defeated Chechnya in the Second Chechen War under Putin. That is a kind of alternative security organization, much much less institutionalized much more available for what people very euphemistically call special tasks. So this Roskvardia is now in Ukraine, um, you know, functioning like an army in the sense that they have camouflage and weapons, but not under zero command structure. You know, you talk about institutionalization. Um, the FSB does have a command structure, obviously, but the, the Roskvardia really doesn't. It's basically a kind of large bodyguard of Putin. So it's more comparable, you know, one hesitates to make these comparisons, but like 
it's more like the SS than like than it's like the army because it's it's not part of the state. It's just a kind of personal, you know, this huge, you know, personal bodyguard which has kind of been let loose. And a lot of the lot of the worst and craziest things one has seen in this war, like um, tanks firing on a nuclear power plant. I'm going to continue. Many experts predict that Putin will not stop at Ukraine and will continue to Moldova, Estonia, Latvia, and others. If this is so. Shouldn't NATO fight Russians in Ukraine rather than wait until the full till they fully occupy and then move to a NATO country? All right. So, so first of all, I just I want to finish answering Sean's question. Um, so the, the 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 final thing I wanted to say is that at the very top of the state, there's a kind of vacuum, right? So the Russian state as a state doesn't really exist. There's a person at the top. He talks to a, a security council once a week, but he's kind of out of reach of all the institutions, including the FSB, which is why everything is so unpredictable, including how his rule will end, which is why the Russian state is behaving so strangely around it, right? Okay, if you guys clear this out, I can try to answer the next question. So then on, on NATO, I mean, I, I don't think it's, I understand the concern, um, but I don't, think it's, I don't think it's that simple. Well, first of all, the, I mean, horrible though this is for Ukraine, and that's a really big important qualification. I and mean, we're talking about a war which is now a war of destruction, in which women and children are being killed senselessly every day. You have no, you know, no justification, whatever, to be there. Um, this is, you know, this is not a war where the Russian armed forces are performing particularly. Well, the Chinese have taken notice of this, as have other potential adversaries of, of Russia. If Russia stays in Ukraine, you know, which I hope very much they don't for their own sake, apart from anything else, um, they're not they're gonna have a hard time making moves against other countries, NATO allies or or not. So I think our, our attention should really be focused on on Ukraine. And the second thing I wanted to say is that I I have to say that I admire the Biden administration and its treatment of this, just generally speaking, because they've, unlike previous administrations, I think both Democratic and Republican, they've done a good job saying what America can do and what America can't do and being realistic about that and asking for help and soliciting and, and getting the help of, of partners and, and having the Europeans lead where, where that's necessary. So I, without getting too much into the, into the details, that's how, that's how I feel about that. Great, let's um, go to Bill Friend. Uh, Dr. Schneider, uh, thanks for coming today. A fascinating presentation. Uh, quick comment and a question. Um, I'm in the English department and I teach Nikolai Gogol's Dead Souls and Gogol's I'm sure you know is one of the great Russian writers despite the fact that he's Ukrainian. And uh, Dead Souls is fascinating because it's a vicious satire of Russian culture in the 19th century in the first part. And the second part, he does a 180 because he got cracked down by the censors. So many of the things that Putin seems to be talking about now, you can already see in the 19th century. Um, but here's my question. And I don't know if it's a useful question. And if it's not, please tell me. Is it possible to see some kind of um, new form of political movement that links, for instance, Orban, Trump, and Putin. Um, all of it seems to bear some similarities with fascism, but I, I don't think it doesn't seem historically accurate to merely call it fascist. Are we seeing the birth of some new kind of totalitarian movement, or are they all too unique to really be lumped together? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I think a lot of smart people are trying to to figure that out. Um, one thing to say right off the top is that they lump themselves together. And so, you know, it, just at a simple empirical level, it becomes a phenomenon where, you know, Trump clearly admires Putin and Putin says openly he wants Trump to win and, tr and, and Putin, um, a, a, a Putin intervenes on Trump's behalf in two presidential elections, not just 2016, which we paid a lot of attention to, but also 2020 when there's a lot of other stuff going on. And I tend to think that among other things, you know, this, this this invasion of Ukraine, which was supposed to end quickly and gloriously, I think it was supposed to be a humiliation for the Biden administration. It hasn't turned out that way, but that's I think part of the that was part of the intention. Um, so one thing is they link themselves together, right? I mean, the, the Republicans today, or some Republicans today, I want to be careful with this. Tucker Carlson is an example of an American conservative who does this. Identify very strongly with Orban 
um, and then lately with Putin, right? So they're they're and then American American the American far right so white so white supremacists, for example, see Putin as a kind of hero. So that's the empirical level, and then there's the ideological level, and here there is certainly some harmony, right? Like fear of demographic disaster. That's a common theme everywhere. You know that they're just that the wrong kind of people are going to be too numerous, and the and the right kind of people are going to be are going to be too few. Um, you know, an anxiety about the rest of the world and sexual anxiety is a big common theme, you know, um, with Trump. I mean, that, you know, that it, it's just Trump is just like a contain, you know, just like an advertisement for sexual anxiety. And and that that is a common and very explicit theme in Russian politics as 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 well. I mean, in, in the Putin administration, the Putin regime, I mean, and then there's a level of technique. And here there's an interesting resemblance to, you know, the 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 total the total refusal of truth and factuality, right? Like that there, there just is no truth, right? There are alternative facts, there are opinions, whatever. And the embrace of spectacle instead, that's common. You know, Trump did it one way and Putin did it another way and Orban does it a third way. But this, this rejection of truth um, and, and it's sort of replacement with a cult of the leader, but the leader doesn't actually have a message, you know, anymore. He just doesn't, he doesn't have a future. Um, he just has a bunch of ways to critique everybody else and to try to make everyone else seem like they're no better than than he is. And so he he is supposed to be the leader, not because he's offering anything, but just because he's better at mocking other things than other people are, like changing the whole discourse that way, right? So there's definitely something going on. I mean, my, my book Road to Unfreedom was largely about this, like trying to pull all the threads together. But, but for now, that's probably as, as well as I can do. <laughs> Thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm just gonna take a question from one of our colleagues. Um, you said tyranny originated in the aftermath of 2016, which put enormous pressure on Europe and the European Union because of Brexit and strains in the transatlantic relationship. If there's a silver lining in the Ukraine situation, do you think that it might be that unity has been generated in the West, typified by Ukraine's continued desire to join the EU and the rejection of the sort of tyranny you wrote about? Mm. So, I mean, I think the most, I'm going to emphasize one aspect of that question. I think the most interesting part of what's happened in the last two weeks has been that the Ukrainians have set an example and that other people have seen it as an example. That's very much a reversal. And that's something which is entirely new. Like not only is Ukraine recognized as a country, but its leader and its people are seen as agents in their own fate behaving in an enviably courageous way, which I think is true. And uh, you know, it's we don't need to talk about too much about Zelensky, but there is obviously a huge difference between a leader who stays and a leader who flees. And there's a huge difference between a leader like Volodymyr Zelensky, who's in his capital risking death in a, in a very real sense, and a leader like Vladimir Putin, who is you know holed away in some bunker somewhere, you know, not even willing to meet other human beings. Um, and people notice that, like the average person notices that. But putting the leader aside, the, the way that Ukrainian, you know, for lack of a better word, the way that Ukrainian civil society has reacted, the way that everybody is doing something, that's a kind of that's an example of what democracy means. Like the democracy is not just a it's not just a word, and it's not just going to vote every two years or four years or whatever. But democracy means the people ruling. You know, my there's a Ukrainian journalist called Natalia Gumenyuk who who wrote a piece in the Washington Post a couple of days ago called um, an, an op-ed, which was called The People's War, which maybe you could put up on the, on the chat. An absolutely terrific piece by an incredibly courageous um, you know, journalist who's been covering wars and uprisings around the world, not just in Ukraine, for, for more than a decade. Astonishing person. But this is her theme. This is what she's documenting, you know, that everybody who can do something is doing something. And that's that's an example, right? So so I think that people have, you know, that the the action and the commitment and the willingness of people to take risks for very simple values. I think you're right. I think that has enlivened leaders and publics to some extent too in, in Europe and, and North America. And I think I like to hope anyway that this could be a kind of turning point not just in the sense that we recognize that there's a threat, but in the sense that we realize that we're better than the threat, you know, that it's not just, it's not just, um, it's not just one version, and another version, but that, you know, our version can be better, like that, that, that civil society can be better, you know, that's not just like, oh, like, I think tyranny is okay, and I don't, you know, that, that actually, 
that there's something enlivening and attractive about a future living in a, in a democracy, you know, that that's something that people could take, if, if Ukrainians could take big risks for it, maybe we can all take small risks for it or smaller risks, risks for it. And then another thing which is hopeful is that I wouldn't want to push this too far, but it's clearly happening, is that Ukraine has, allowed, has been a bit of an icebreaker in conversations, you know, among like inside countries, like in Germany, um, but also among countries and among different political orientations, right? So I, I've seen conversations, you know, among people who hadn't really been talking to each other much for the last few years in the US, who now at least on this one thing, are able to have a conversation. And, you know, I like to hope that that's the beginning of something better. I, um, I'd like to call on Valerie Rusansky. Uh, first though, I want to uh, commend the audience for hanging in with us during that annoyance. Um, this is what happens when you try to have civil discourse about controversial topics. And I'm glad that everybody hung in there. I'm sorry, Tim, that that happened, but it happened. That's the world we live in today. Valerie. Certainly hope I'll get some better lighting. Certainly, yeah. firstly, oop, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for coming here. It's absolutely incredible having you here. I just looked into your work and I am very impressed and it's definitely gonna be the next few books I read. Uh, secondly, this is more of a dual prong question. Uh, firstly, it's going back to the, uh, the unionizing of Europe and what this is sort of doing culturally. Do you think this might uh, speed up the process of Turkey becoming part of the EU? Uh, if at all, and it could be connected or separate. Uh, do you think this will add to secessionist movements in the Caucasus and how that might affect trans-Caucasian uh, communications and the economics of that? Mm -hmm. Those are, okay, that's, that's, those are, those are great questions, Valerie. Um, let me, let me, let me start with, um, with the first one about Europe. I'll, I'll tell you what I hope is going to happen right now. You know, you're already thinking bigger than me, but uh, what I hope is going to happen is that when European heads of government and heads of state meet tomorrow in Versailles, they're going to issue an invitation to Ukraine to begin negotiations for full membership in the European Union. You know, because we're like, we're thinking, we're talking about Ukraine as though like it's, it, you know, it's an example, it's in Europe, but it's not a member of the European Union. You know, it's, and, uh, and its president, Zelensky has officially applied. You know, he, he made a, they, they, he even, even, you know, in his, in his camouflage, you know, he went out and like there was a table and he signed something, you know, and held it up. They're officially applying to join the European Union. And I think the European Union can make good on what it says its own legacy is, the legacy of preventing war by beginning those negotiations or saying these negotiations will begin when the war is over. And that seems very important because for a lot of reasons, but partly because it will give Ukrainians something positive to come out of this war. You know, many of them have died, many more sadly probably are going to die. Um, they've lost a lot of infrastructure, they're, they're gonna keep losing things. But the, the possibility of European Union membership would be something for Ukraine. And so that's already that's already thinking pretty big. Um, Turkish, you know, Turkey itself under its present leadership is, is, is not so interested in European Union membership, but I don't, I don't rule out that something like that could happen in, you know, in, in a larger realignment, which could result from this war. Moving to your second question, I, I just, I generally think that it's like, you know, it's, it's funny saying this, but like there's just, it's so obvious that this war is not in the interest of the Russian Federation as it's presently constituted. It's, it's not in the interest of the Russian Federation to raise, ever, to raise border questions and to, and to suggest that borders can be changed. Um, and it's not in the interest of the Russian Federation to, you know, to divert all of its forces to one place, because I mean, I wouldn't want to make specific predictions, but it, it, it's the lesson that's being taught here is that borders can be changed by force, you know, in and around Russia. And, and, and just to be very clear, I'm not saying that the West or the United States would have anything to do with that. On the contrary, <laughs> the West, the United States would like the Russian Federation to be a sovereign, normal country in its current, in its, in its current legal borders, I think if anything, the West, the United States are worried that this war is going to end up with making Russia a Chinese vassal, you know, with or without the change, the change of borders. But I, I agree with you at Russia, you know, by not, by not recognizing the sovereignty and the borders of its neighbor, Russia is opening up the question in principle about, you know, something in general that it, it likes to, it likes to talk about supporting. It, it's opening up the principle of can borders be changed? 
right? And that's that just seems like a a terribly unwise a terribly unwise thing to do when you yourself define yourself as a federation, when you have lots of national minorities, and when you have the most populous and the second most powerful country, you know, in, in military terms, um, and in some ways the most powerful country as, as your neighbor. It just doesn't seem like a wise move. Thank you for that. I want to turn to a question from one of our students um, talking about memory. Um, as Putin has declared a war on Nazism and echoes memories of World War II atrocities in order to legitimize his war, have the people of Ukraine attempted to counter this with their own memory of the Russian committed atrocities, particularly the Ukrainian memory of the Holodomor or famine, right, if it comes up? Yeah, um, so, so number one, I spent I spent a lot of time in other in other places, um, and I wrote a bunch of articles, like one in the Washington Post and one in the Boston Globe, about this language of denazification, uh, which is obviously you know fraudulent and bogus, and it's it's itself meant to set up, unfortunately, an atrocity. Because when you say the other side, when you say that the other side is genocidal and that you're going to set up a tribunal and so on, which Putin said on the Thursday when he started the war, you're basically saying I'm about to commit a war crime, you know, and and uh, so I don't want to dwell on that too much. Um, I will mention that uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, in a speech that he gave a few hours before the war started in the address to Russians, he did he did take on the, the Nazi thing directly, you know, in, in, a, in a way which I thought was very typically Ukrainian. He basically said, you know, look, we suffered a lot during this war, too, which is true. The Ukrainians, not just relatively speaking, but absolutely speaking, lost more civilians than than Russians did in the Second World War. Um, and the, you know, the German war aim in the Second World War was to subdue and control and make a colony precisely of of Ukraine. Um, and so but what he says is like you can't, you know, it's it's ludicrous to call us Nazis, you know, when we've when we've lost so much. And then he did he did actually go a little personal on that, talking about how his grandfather was a was a an infantryman in the Red Army. What he didn't say um, is that his, his his grandfather's family was killed in the Holocaust. You know, he did not he didn't go that far. But a lot of I mean, I think most of his listeners would have would have known that. Um, and by now, many Americans know that too. Um, I don't so. But answering the question. In a literal way, I don't think Ukrainians in general feel like they at this point have to go to the Holodomor and have to talk about that stuff. I mean, they don't have one thing that's obvious is that they don't really have time. You know, like when I talk to my Ukrainian friends, I try to keep it like short and sweet and like, are you OK? And what can I do and move on? Because they just don't have time. You know, they don't have they don't they don't have like Putin has a lot of time. Like the guy published a 7000 word article about how Russia and Ukraine have historical unity. He has, the guy has a lot of time, you know. He has a lot of time, um, but the Ukrainians don't, you know, they're fighting a war, everybody's doing something. And I think their own reference point is more, you know, their clear understanding that this war is about their own national survival. And they think that ought to be clear to everybody. And even if they don't have time to make it clear, they have to behave as though it's true because for them it is. And, you know, just quite literally, like if you were the kind of person, you know, who's like people who are pursuing a university education, you know, like you folks are on this call, like you would be part of the, you would be part, you could be on the kill list if you were Ukrainian, right? Because that is what Putin has in mind. The idea is that you have to, you have to remove everybody who is educated, who has some kind of political commitment. Those people have to be gotten out of the way. That's what he means by, you know, destroying the Ukrainian nation, getting everybody who has thoughts of their own out of the way, you know, in a camp or killed so that the rest of the country can be governed. We might be slow to pick that up, but the Ukrainians are not slow to pick that up. They understand that this is about their survival as, 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 a, as a nation. They may not have time to explain it to us, you know, in a way that we're going to get, but they, but they get it. And so I'm just saying, um, I don't even, I don't see that many references to the whole little more out there. And I think it's partly because they feel they don't need to say it, or they don't have time to actually do all the backing up and explaining that would be necessary to get, to get to that. But I appreciate the mention of it because, of course, Holodomor, the famine of, of 32, 33 in Soviet Ukraine, it is one of the things which makes Ukrainian historical consciousness different from Russian historical consciousness, which is worth knowing about. Great, thank you. I'd like to call on Riley Kerr. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Snyder. Um, 
So I know that uh, the media is really exaggerating its news articles and that the Russian state media is in full swing spreading propaganda. Uh, beginning in the presentation, you said you kind of, as a, as a historian, you had a way of see, kind of seeing through that. Um, so in your opinion, uh, in the future, as this conflict grows, um, could this grow into like a new Cold War type of setting? And how likely is it for nuclear weapons to be involved? So let me first talk about media because what because it's it's like me media. I mean, you guys all know this because you know you grew up in this environment. But media consumption habits are really important during a war. Uh, and you know the general rule, and this is something I did I did talk about in on tyranny, is that you should be reading things that are reported by actual people. It's a very simple rule, but you know, 99.99999% of the stuff which is going to come across our feeds if we're not careful is not that. You know, so we, we have a way of we have a habit of always talking about the news, but we don't actually support the people who actually generate factual knowledge about what's going on. It's a kind of strange, you know, it's it's as though we eat all the time, but we have no farmers, you know. <laughs> That's kind of how we are with information. And so uh, just before I answer your question, I just want to stress that there are, you know, there are, there are Russian reporters. It's really hard to be a Russian reporter right now. It's unbelievable what the Russian state has done to its remaining independent media in the last week. You know, the lights have basically gone out. But there are Russian reporters in exile um, in Riga, Latvia, who write for something called Medusa, which is, which is quite good. You know, which is which, and they have an English edition. You can sign up to their, you can sign up to their, their, their free, you know, email thing. Um, so you know, do that, right? Because those are actual reporters. And then there are, you know, there are Ukrainian reporters who are at work. Um, and 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 by the way, even when you see like when you read American news sources, like or you watch American TV, the producers or the editors of those American sources, the only way that they know anything or they get anywhere. Is that Ukrainians are helping them, you know? So that, like, the, e even if you're not seeing the Ukrainian reporters, like they're there in the background, like serving as the fixers or whatever, getting. So it, it, if you can, like, at least try to support Ukrainian Ukrainian journalists too, um, by by giving them by giving them some clicks. Um, you know, there there are Ukrainian journalists at places like, um, you know, Suspilna is one of the names of the, of the place. Um, uh, Zaborona is another one. Um, they, they all have they all have pages in English you know you can you can you can try to follow them or start start there instead of just starting on on your on your feed and with American journalists you know that the Times does have some people the New York Times does have some people in Ukraine now there aren't that many very, very many American journalists in Ukraine but like it, it just look for the look for the byline you know start with the people who are actually there and then make up your mind, but like make up your mind on the basis of, of actual reporting by actual people. I know I'm pounding that point into the ground, but it's just extremely important because there's so much, there's so much else going on, you know, commentary, but also just all kinds of manipulations and provocations. But they're also, but the war reporters are the good guys, whether they're Russian reporters or Ukrainian reporters or American reporters or whatever. The war reporters, like the people who actually put their bodies on the line to report from a place. Those are those are the good guys. Okay, as far as new Cold War, um, I wouldn't use the so I wouldn't use the Cold War metaphor just because America and Russia have moved on and we're different countries at this point. And uh, the Soviet Union had a vision for the world which Russia doesn't. Um, and and Russia's you know the, the Soviet Union, whatever one thinks of its ideology, it had a notion that it itself was an example for the world. Whereas Russia doesn't have that. Russia has the idea has a kind of negative idea. I mean this regime. It has the negative idea that other people's orders should be confused and distracted and dissolved and made to, and made to fall apart, but that's not really an idea for the, for the world. And Russia, I mean, Russia is still a nuclear power and I'll, I'll get to that, but Russia and China have meanwhile inverted their positions. You know, at the end of the Cold War, the Soviet Union was still more important and China was less important, but now that's been inverted. You know, now China is much more important and Russia is much less important. And as I said before, the, the, the geopolitical danger for Russia in this war is that Russia becomes a kind of vassal of China. And, and uh, you know, that's, so that's not a Cold War type situation, right? Where we're sitting here, at least I am, you know, worried that Russia is not gonna be able to maintain its integrity as an economy or as a political system. 
as a result of this war because of China, right? So, so things have things have changed. But it, it, you know, on the on the nuclear stuff, it's such an odd thing, you know, because like people, like people in in, in Jim's generation, my generation, you know, we we grew up with. You know, at least when we were young, with nuclear with nuclear war as being a kind of everyday preoccupation. Like we thought about nuclear war almost the way that you guys think about COVID. You know, every day, like every day. Like there used to be these things called phone surveys, and people would call you on your landline and they'd ask you, like, they'd, they'd, there'd be surveys. And I remember, like, as a teenager, surveys would be like, "How worried are you about nuclear war today?" <laughs> Right. Like, and of course you were worried about it. Like you thought about it literally every day, the word Holocaust, which is now used to mean the extermination of Jews. Um, in the eighties, that word actually meant nuclear war. If someone said Holocaust, you know, it referred to nuclear war rather than to the extermination of Jews most of the time. And I'm just stressing that to say that um, this fear of nuclear war, it's very powerful, but nuclear war, you know, is held off still by the same logic that held it off back then, which is mutually assured destruction. Um, one thing that I'm pretty sure about, about Mr. Putin, judging from the two years of COVID distancing, is that he's a man who doesn't want to die. And, um, you know, so he, so he talks about nuclear weapons a lot. I mean, I don't think there's ever been a leader who has talked about the use of nuclear weapons as much as he has talked about them. But I, I don't see, I, 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 I fail to see the logic under which he would use them just for the simple reason that, although I don't think he would care if Russia were destroyed, I think he would care if he himself were, were destroyed, which is a logical, which is a logical result of the use of nuclear weapons, at least on a kind of intercontinental scale. I think more worrying is more worrying is the possibility, although I think it's also unlikely, but I think it's possible, is some kind of use of tactical nuclear weapons by Russia and Ukraine. I think that's not, I think that's not impossible um, because just because we're at the stage in the career that we are of this, of this particular man. Um, I'd like to call on Troy. I'm out here. Hi, Tim, how you doing? Uh, oh, he's got his mic. He's got his mic. So, Tim, I, I just wanted to maybe bring you back to your historian roots and um, speaking as someone who's actually sitting in Moscow now and probably on one of those lists we've talked about. Um, I'm going to ask about Russia, not that in any way I want to slight what's happening to all our people in Ukraine, but that's been covered. And so um, I'm worried about or I, I'm, I'm interested in kind of the, the politics of grievance and the politics of retribution. And so, you know, you've written a lot of, you know, about uh, post-World War II. And so um, one part of it is, you know, uh, you see this massive anti-Russianism everywhere in, in a kind of, you know, over the top way. I, I understand where some of that comes from, but, you know, I think we're worried here that uh, Russians will be seen after this the way Germans were seen after World War II, straight across the board, as if everyone was in on it, that for some reason they didn't stop Putin and it's kind of on them. You see that in the way the sanctions have just amazingly piled on. I mean, these sanctions are going to hurt regular people. and They're going to hurt the people who actually, you know, don't want him in power. Um, the other thing I'm worried about is it's going to fuel this grievance, like after World War I, the, the, the idea that you know, part of Putin's appeal has always been everyone's out to hold great Russia down. Everyone's out there against us. You know, it's never, you know, it's never Russia's fault. If a, an athlete dopes, it's it's not him who did it. It's the everyone's out to get him. And, you know, this kind of nonsense. But this this plays into this. I mean, you know, this over the top sanctions, basically the idea to destroy this economy, and destroy this country in order to get them to push Putin out. Um, it reminds me of kind of the, the strategies that we had in, in World War II with Germans and, and, and Japanese. So I just wondered what you think were, you know, the, the externalities there. Uh, I won't go into, you know, what's happened here in terms of the, you know, kind of cultivization of the population and the destruction of journalism. You know that as well as I do, and, and that's frightening. But, it, you know, if you, if, if you wouldn't mind taking a shot at the history stuff, that would be fantastic. Thanks, yeah. Troy. Okay, uh, Troy. It's nice. It's nice to see you. It's nice. Nice to hear from you. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just make. I'll make. A, I'll make a few remarks. You know, and obviously I'm not sitting where, where you're sitting. I don't see all the things that, that you see. 
Um, and then maybe these remarks will kind of circle around. I mean, so coming out from the other side, one thing which is striking is that there are a lot of folks, you know, with Russian passports and American passports who are very much on Putin's side at this moment, right? There are a lot, there are a lot of, there are a lot of folks who are not in Russia, whose lives are not being touched by the sanctions in, in any way. And, uh, you know, who are American citizens, for example, who are, um, who are rah-rah Putin right now, which is something which is visible from here. You know, it may not be visible from, from, from Russia. And that may have something to do with the phenomenon that you're talking about, that it's not, if you're in the West, if you're in America and you're in like, and you know Russian and you're following these discussions, um, I mean, I, I don't have to say this, we were just Zoom bombed by a bunch of people, um, some of whom were clearly Americans. Um, you know, but if you're, in, if you're in the US, like you're conscious of the fact that, uh, that there is a lot of pro-war sentiment among Russians, including international Russians. And that, like, that's just a kind of fact that's that's in the air, you know. Like, we we know that it's not true that every Russian who's outside of Russia is somehow anti-Putin. Like, in general, that's you know, that's unfortunately not the not the case. Just, there's lots of nice news news coverage of Russians who are ashamed by the war, and I know that's all true. Um, but like at the at the level of you know at the level of like everyday conversation, there's a different story here. Number number two, I think it's. I think this issue of responsibility is incredibly tricky. You know, I mean, I share, I share your, I, I share your historical concern over how these things work emotionally over over the long run. Um, but there's like it's very tricky territory here because when you know one tempting thing to say, and President Biden has said it a bunch of times, is well, we know this is not you Russians, we know this is just Putin, right? And that's not entirely true either, you know, <laughs> like it can't be just one guy, right? It can't be, it's never just one, one guy. And so that like that, that's not true. And then as you say, of course, it's also not true that every Russian is equally involved and everyone should be punished equally. But, you know, I think, I think the language that's relevant is the language of responsibility, you know, which I kind of which I'm plagiarizing from actually Russian and other dissidents from the 1970s, that you know that everyone should be doing some little thing, and if you're not doing some little thing, then in some way you 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 are complicit. But of course, that's a that's a you know that's a moral stance which is incredibly demanding, and for which people would have to take a lot of risks in Russia. It's heartening, and for me at least, that some people are willing to to take that risk. And number three on politics of grievance, yeah, but. It's the politics of grievance is kind of inexhaustible, you know, no matter no matter what you do, right? Like Ukraine could have given every, you know, like the president, like, like Ukraine elected a Russian speaking president multiple times in a row, but that didn't stop Putin from saying that they're committing genocide against Russian speakers. You know, it's like you can keep feeding that maw of grievance. You can just feed it everything and it doesn't seem to actually change what you're doing. So. I'm not sure that, you know, I'm not sure that holding back would make any difference. I mean, Putin himself said, like, they're going to sanction us regardless of what we do because of who we are, you know. And so he's also kind of saying it doesn't really matter whether you whether you sanction or not. Um, and then I guess one more thing, you know, since you ask about the post-war comparison, um, we actually started liking the Germans again pretty quickly. <laughs> Right. Um, we, you know, the Germans were our military allies very quickly after the Second World War um, and American denazification. I'm now talking about the actual historical process of denazification was, you know, probably too mild rather than rather than too extreme. And by the late 40s, early 50s, our propaganda was already very much gung ho in the other direction that, you know, we had our good Germans and all the bad Germans were on the other side and the Soviets were doing the same thing. They had all the good Germans and all the bad Germans were on the other side, which I just mentioned to say that, you know, that that's I don't mean to sound too cynical, but I just mentioned to say that that the American view of Russians can switch really fast really fast, like in, in under the Roosevelt administration, you know, as you know, Soviet Union was pretty cool, um, you know, and then, and then under the, in, in the, during the Second World War, you know, in the middle, towards the end of the Roosevelt administration, the, the cover of, you know, hold on a second. 
this is Life magazine in, in 1943. Um, and the entire the entire issue is devoted to how great Russians are. And you know, that's four years before the Cold War started. We were, you know, we were saying that we were saying the Germans were responsible for the Katyn massacre, you know, because the Russians were our allies. The Russians, the Russians were great. And then it turned on very quickly when the Cold War started, very, very, very quickly. And so I guess as a historian, what I would say is that these things can actually change pretty quickly. I don't have any difficulty imagining the following scenario. Regime change in Russia, um, uh, Russia switches to seeing China as its basic geopolitical threat, which it is, I mean, which it is in fact, and America dropping, you know, dropping sanctions and suddenly Russia becomes a normal country again, because we have very short memories, you know, we're doing all this stuff now. And, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you about the hardship this is causing to like kinds of people that we both know, but I don't, I mean, I guess it, being a historian makes me kind of open to the history of human flexibility and all this stuff. It doesn't mean that we're going to keep seeing Russians this way in the future. I, I can see if I can see a future where we wouldn't. Anyway, it's good to see you, Troy. Thanks, Tim. That that you make me feel a little bit better. I was just going to throw in there that you know, it, rather, even besides the 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 Time Magazine, there were a raft of amazing, basically pro-Russian not propaganda films, but Hollywood films in 44, oh, yeah. 45, yeah. That, that that really kind of make your point. But yep. um, well, I'm going to have to. Yeah. Thanks. Have anyway, to I just wanted to say thanks. Yep. We just wanted to ask, I think, one more question. Um, Jody would have a question. And then, um, uh, Tim, you've been so generous to spend so much time with us. If we could just wrap up with one question. Thank you, Jim. Quite so amazing. Um, I just wanted to sort of bring it back to on tyranny. Um, if you were to rewrite or update at this moment, is there something that you would add or is there one lesson that you want to leave with us? Well, uh, so I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, the book, as I already said to you, the book came out of a certain moment, but it's, it's written about civic engagement in general. And one of the things that surprised me about it was, you know, I was thinking about Americans, but then immediately, there were immediately pirate translations in Russian, immediately. Um, and there's also, there's now a legal translation in, 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 in Russian. And uh, people started using it in Poland and in Hungary and in India and Brazil, which I didn't expect at all. Um, but what it taught, what, it, what I realized was, you know, I'm being kind of provincial because the arguments that I'm making here, which I'm borrowing from all over the place, but especially from um, communist history and, and, and the history of resistance to, to, to fascism and, and national socialism, that these arguments are pretty universal kinds of arguments. And uh, so no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, I might add a word or two about Russia's war, but there are already references in here to Russia and, and, and Ukraine. You know, when people read this book, they say, oh, well, wait a minute, you already, you already mentioned Putin in this book, which I, which I did a couple of times. So no, I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, and as far as far as the lessons, you know, the, the the most famous one, the most important one we already mentioned, which is do not obey in advance. But I, I'll, I'll close with um, number eighteen and number twenty, because I think those are ones which um, you know Ukrainians have have been kind of teaching me over and over again. Number eighteen is uh, be calm when the unthinkable arrives, and number twenty is be as courageous as you can. Hmm. Thank you so much. Tim, that was fantastic. Um, we really appreciate your taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule and all the good work that you do. So I wanna thank you from the whole Rowan uh, community and I um, and, uh, hope we'll see you soon. Yeah. And thank you. Okay, yep. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you so much for bearing with us as well through that. You were unflappable. I thought that was actually, I mean, in a way, it couldn't have been better because <laughs> it helped to make one of the points about how the war has two levels. You know, there's a war on the ground, but there's also a war for concepts and minds, and that's how it's pursued, you know? So there was a lesson there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.